Georgia. Uh, people have often asked me how I got started working for or with Elvis, and actually my career with Elvis actually started long before Elvis was ever around. My uncle is Tom Diskin, who was Colonel Parker's right-hand man for many, many years, long before the colonel was designated as the colonel. And uh, back in Chicago, Illinois, where I was born, uh, the colonel would come over to our house with my real Uncle Tom, and he wasn't known as the colonel then, and we called him Uncle Tom also. We thought we had two Uncle Toms. And the colonel and his wife, Marie, would come over to our house, and we had back then seven children in our family and we would all audition for the colonel singing songs like good night irene which was popular back then we uh... moved out to california in nineteen fifty two and we were the only part of the diskin bonja clan that moved out to the west coast for several years and colonel and tom my uncle used to travel around with their various shows uh, all over the country, and they were in California a lot. Uh, he was managing Eddie Arnold, and Eddie Arnold was playing down at the Coronado Hotel in San Diego one evening, and the colonel would come to our house anytime he was in town for Sunday dinner usually. Uh, when he showed up, he would always come in a big s station wagon with full of food and groceries. By that time, we finally had about 10 children in our family and the colonel was like Santa Claus coming whenever he came. He and Tom, my uncle, would drive up in the station wagon and they would have groceries coming out everywhere. Uh, big sacks of potato, 100 pound sacks of potato and it was a great thing to see the colonel coming. One thing that I really remember that got us into the Elvis world kind of in a way, after dinner one Sunday afternoon the colonel would always light up a cigar and he did light up a cigar, and he sat back in his chair, and he said, You know, I signed a new boy the other day. His name is Elvis Presley, and I think he's going to be pretty big. And one of the reasons I remember that story so vividly is that the way he said putty instead of pretty big, with his southern drawl, he said putty big. And I always thought that was kind of cute the way he did that. So... We knew about Elvis probably before very many people in the world knew about Elvis and Elvis and the Colonel. And we grew up with all his records. Uh, gosh, the Colonel would send us an uh, RCA uh, record player to play all his 45s on. He'd send us anytime there was a new picture out or a new photo album, we'd get that. My entire family grew up as Elvis fans. When Elvis played at the Pan Pacific Auditorium in Los Angeles in 1957, we were all there. And a funny thing about that that I remember with my three older sisters who were all very quiet, very conservative, when Elvis came out on stage, <laughs> all he did was stand, because this was the second night of his appearance and he had been told by the police not to move around because he created a havoc with the crowd. They went crazy. When he came out on stage and didn't move, for several, oh, 30 seconds, and all of a sudden he would just move his thumb a little bit, and the whole place went crazy. And I looked down at my three sisters, who were these quiet, conservative teenagers, and they were on their knees screaming and pulling at their hair. Another scene I will never forget about my sisters. Later on, years later, the colonel asked me if I'd like to come to work as a secretary on a movie they were making. I, I, I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was Girl Happy in 64, the summer of 64. He needed us another secretary, and MGM would pay for it. It was $80 a week, which was a fortune to me at the time. I went to work and just answered fan mail and filed pictures and things like that. A lot of different things. Part of the job was spending two weeks in Palm Springs with the colonel, which wasn't too bad either. And... Uh, it was that time that I met Elvis for the first time. It was uh, Colonel's birthday, and it was June 25th, and Elvis had a surprise birthday party for the Colonel, and my Uncle Tom introduced me to Elvis at that party. And it was just a quick, hello, how are you? This is my nephew. Nice to meet you. However, a couple of weeks later, after we returned from Palm Springs, the Colonel was having a real serious back problem, and he was at home in, in traction, and I had moved into his spare bedroom at his apartment, and he told me one day that uh, late at night, probably around midnight, Elvis and Joe Esposito would be coming by 
to talk business before they drove the bus back to Tennessee, to Memphis. And sure enough, midnight, there was a knock on the door, and I opened the door, and there was Elvis. And I couldn't believe it, but I was trying to be a 19-year-old cool teenager and not show that I was impressed or excited or anything, and I shook hands with both of them. And I told Elvis that the colonel was down in his uh, office where they'd put a special bed for the traction, and uh, could he go down there and talk to him? And Joe Esposito and I sat in the living room and talked while Elvis was talking to the colonel. In a short while, Elvis came back and he said to Joe, uh, Joe, Colonel wants to see you for a few minutes. And for the next 18 minutes, it was just Elvis and me sitting in this living room talking about normal things, you know, sports, school, entertainers, singing, whatever. And it was the greatest 18 minutes I think I've spent with one person in my whole life. And it's a memory which I will never forget. I worked again for the colonel. He called me again in 1970, in June. He said, we're going to be playing Las Vegas for 30 days. We're going to do the four-week engagement there. And then we're going to do something we haven't done in many, many years. We're going to go out and do personal appearance tours. And he asked me if my brother Ronnie and I would like to come on the tours and just be there to do anything that needed to be done to make sure everything was taken care of. And, you know, basically you could call us what they call roadies. We, we loaded and unloaded planes and trucks and set up the stage and took down the equipment, carried luggage. Whatever needed to be done to make sure the show ran smoothly, we did. And the colonel also said to me, he says, I know you're taking a photography class. I was just starting to take a beginning photography class. And he said, if you want to bring your camera, you can take pictures if you want. And I didn't have a good camera, but I did bring my camera. And I did take pictures, and it got me so interested in photography that I changed my major from French to photography, and it changed a lot of things in my life after that. But we went up to Las Vegas for the last three weeks of the engagement to get things ready for the tour, to make luggage tags and backstage passes and things like that, and to, to mark all the equipment, to weigh everything for the planes. Right from Las Vegas, we went out to Phoenix, Arizona, and then the following day, after that travel day, we started the first tour. Uh, I was still going to school at the time, so I, when the tour was over, I went back to school. And then when the next tour came up in November that year, I took off a couple of weeks, went on the tour, and came back. And that really put me through school in style, because we made real nice money on those tours. And when I finished my education, I had gotten a teaching credential, but there were no teaching jobs in photography, which I really preferred to do. And the colonel called me again and said, why don't you come to work for me full time? And I thought about two seconds. I said, yeah, I will. That's fantastic. So I went to work from full time, and that's when they made me the tour manager. And we prepared for the tours and took care of the show people on the tour. Uh, did everything that was necessary to be done. I worked with Al DeVorn a lot uh, in concessions. When he was on other tours with uh, other stars like uh, Frank Sinatra or John Denver, I would run the concessions myself. So I wore a lot of different hats and did a lot of different jobs. And a lot of people would, who, who do know of me from the photography would say, well, why didn't you take more pictures of Elvis? But they don't realize that, one, I was really, I learned photography basically on the job filming Elvis, what a way to learn, and also that I only took pictures of Elvis when I wasn't totally exhausted from the other jobs, and when I kind of felt Elvis looked good, because sometimes he looked tired and I didn't want to take pictures of him. Later on when he got put on some weight, I'd wait until he lost weight, and then I'd start taking more pictures of him, and I filmed him from 1970 through 1975, mid-75, and he had put on a little weight again, and he didn't look as good as he normally looked. So after the 19, mid-75 tour in June, I stopped taking pictures again, thinking I'd wait until he lost some more weight, and then I'd start up again. And unfortunately, as we all know, that never happened. So that, that in a nutshell, is kind of the story of uh, how I got in with the Elvis show, how I got in with the Colonel. I worked for Colonel Parker as his assistant, and I had many different titles on the show. And quote, official photographer was one of those titles for the Elvis Presley show. And that's, that's a brief synopsis of how it all happened for me. Elvis was playing Memphis. It was a closing show. 
And after he had made all the introductions of his band members and of the, the backup singers, he said, let me have your attention for a minute. He said, uh, uh, I want to give my personal thanks to a lot of people who have put this show together. He said, first of all, to Tom Diskin, who does all of this. And then he introduced his sound men, Bill Porter and Bruce Jackson. And while he was talking, he was over on the left side of the stage. And I was on the ground, but I had my elbow up on the stage, and I was taking pictures of him as he was talking. He kept looking at me as I was clicking away with my camera. And then he says, and there's another guy here, who's, and he looks at me, and he says, uh, he's the head of our luggage crew, takes care of all our luggage for us. Uh, his name is uh, Ed Bonja, and he looks at me again, and he says, whoever that is, and only the people on the stage, of course, and the people that knew me got a kick out of it and laughed about it, but there was a giggle on the stage. I got a whole list of people I'd like to, uh, to give my uh, personal thanks to. And uh, uh, my sound engineer, just a second, honey, please. My sound engineers, uh, Bruce Jackson and uh, Bill Porter, and, uh, and uh, uh, the guy that's head of our luggage crew, Ed Bonja, whoever that is, and uh, the, guy, the guy that produced... Following that show, Elvis had a party over at Graceland for all the show people, and he was sitting in his big chair down in the jungle room, and I was late getting over there because I have to finish up with the concessions to make sure the stage is properly taken down and everything gets to the airport. So by the time I got there, it was after midnight, and when I went in and I walked up and I shook hands with Elvis and I said, whoever that is, huh? and he starts laughing, he says, I had forgotten your last name was Bonja. He says, so that was you I was making fun of. And I said, yeah. So, but I forgave him. I remember a funny story that happened in 1971 when J.D. Sumner and Stamps first joined the show group. Um, I had never heard J.D. Sumner before, and I was absolutely amazed at how low his voice was. And at that time, and, and now too, I could do something with my voice that hurts like crazy, but I do it sometimes, that I can get down real low and talk a little bit like J.D. After that show, the following morning, uh, one of the things I did as tour manager, I would call everybody on the show and make sure they were awake and tell them to put their luggage out in front of their doors because the bellmen were going to pick it up at a certain time and tell them what time the bus was going to be there. When I got to J.D.'s name, I dialed his room number and he picked up the phone and said, Hello. And I said, Hello, J.D. <laughs> and he was laughing. He says, By God, who is this? <laughs> it even hurts now when I say that. <laughs> anyway, J.D. remembered that for several years later. Uh, something happened in Dallas, Texas during an intermission of a show. We were all backstage in a circle all the, the sweet inspirations, uh, J.D. and the Stamps, the musicians, and just talking, waiting for the intermission to get over to start the second half of the show. And the big doors in the back of the auditorium opened up, and Elvis's limousine drove in. He got out of the car and walked over and got into, into the circle standing next to J.D. And J.D. had a cup of Coca-Cola, we thought, in his hand. It was a red cup that said Coke on it. And he was sipping it, and Elvis was standing there for a few minutes talking, and then he reached over and he said, J.D., let me have a sip of that. I'm as dry as I can be. And J.D. pulled the cup back and said, no, you don't want to drink this. You'll be singing bass tonight. And Elvis pulled it over and he says, what do you got in there? And he sniffed it. He said, my God, it's whiskey. <laughs> he says, what, are you a drunk now? <laughs> and J.D. says, no, no, no. He says, uh, there's a good reason I drink this. He says, when I drink it just before the show, it burns my tonsils, and I, it allows me to sing lower. And Elvis just started laughing. He said, oh, you're getting to be a drunk. Don't give me that. And at that moment, J.D. was looking across the circle right to where I was. And we made eye contact, and we both knew exactly what he was going to do. So he turned to Elvis. He says, Elvis, I can prove that this works. I'll show you how it works. He, he looked around the circle. He says, come over here. He says, Eddie, Eddie, you come over here. Show Elvis how this works. And I purposely tried to raise my voice and saying, you know, J.D., I can't do that because I don't drink at all. I don't ever take alcohol. He says, just take a little sip and show Elvis that this really works. I says, well, I'll do it just one time. 
So I picked the Coke cup and took a little tiny sip. I swallowed it and I waited a second. Said, By God, that's good whiskey. <laughs> and Elvis almost rolled over on his back. He was laughing so hard. And that's one of the, the funniest things that I can remember happening on the tours. I don't remember the exact year. It was it was 1975. I mean the year, the exact date. But during 1975, we had at least three airplanes on the tour. Actually, we had four. We had the Colonel's Learjet, who he was the advance man, so he was always a day ahead of us. Elvis's plane, of course. We had the uh, show plane, which normally was a, a four-engine Electra prop jet. And we started using a, another plane, a smaller plane, for the concessions to carry along the books and the pictures and the posters and the photo albums. And I carried a crew of several men on that plane. And we also carried some of the sound men. And one of my other duties on the tour was to help out with the concessions. And when Al DeVorn wasn't on the tour, when he was doing a tour with John Denver or someone else, and it conflicted and he wasn't there, I ran the concessions myself. And the picture shows us on the airplane with a table and all of us with a hand of cards in our hand playing poker. And I had taken all the money from the concessions and passed out, you know, 10,000, 20,000 to each guy. And all the money was in a pile on the table. And uh, one of the guys got up and took a picture of it. And uh, I want to say if any of the guys that are in that picture are, are still around or are seeing this film, I'm still missing some of that money. <laughs> One of the funny things that happened uh, while I was with Elvis was about the scarfs that he threw out from the stage. We were in Las Vegas uh, in early 1975, probably you know, late January, February for the engagement. And one evening, the Colonel and I were not in the booth. We were standing in the back of the showroom and Elvis threw out a ton of scarves. He was just throwing them out like crazy and Charlie was bringing them over to him and boy they were going so fast. After the show the Colonel had Joe Esposito come up to the casino manager's office and he asked him how much those scarves cost that Elvis has thrown out. And if I remember correctly Joe said they were like $25 each which I think is pretty expensive <laughs> to keep throwing that many scarves out. Of course I don't have the money that Elvis had but anyway the colonel said, boy, that's getting expensive, isn't it? A little while later, Artie Newman, who was one of the assistants at the casino, assistant manager, came into the casino office and he brought with him a gentleman who was from Korea, who was the leader of a gambling junket. And the man coincidentally owned sewing machine factories that made clothes and all kinds of other materials. And the colonel got to talking to him and he said, you know, we have these scarves that Elvis throws out. He says, could you make something like this? He says, maybe even make it a little bit bigger, but nice fabric, nice material so it looked good, and maybe put Elvis's name on it, silk screen his name on it. And the guy says, sure, I can do that with no problem. And the colonel said, uh, well, how much would it cost me to have those made? Uh, like 10 different colors. And the guy says, well, how many do you want? He said, 50,000. He said, it cost you 99 cents each. Colonel said, let's put in the order. Weeks later, we went back. We were at the studio, our, our offices at MGM Studios in Culver City. And we got a phone call that the scarves were in, but that the customs officials would not release the scarves to be delivered to our office because they were not labeled where they were from. Each scarf had to have a label on it saying, made in Korea. So the manufacturer had to hire a company to go over and open each box up and take every single scarf out and put a label on it made in Korea. A couple of weeks went by, they were finally delivered to our offices. When the colonel saw the scarf with the label, he says, oh, we can't have this made in Korea label on here. We got to get rid of these. Eddie, make arrangements, get, get these taken off. So I called two of my brothers and I called a couple of my cousins and brought them all down to the office. And for a week, they took labels off all the scarves that had just had the labels put on them. Then we had all the scarves, and we were going to do two things with them. One, we were going to supply Elvis with scarves, and two, we were going to sell them on tour for $5 each. 
on tour and in Las Vegas. So when we went on tour, the colonel talked to Elvis and his father, Vernon, and made a deal with him that instead of buying these scarves from this other guy for $25, he would buy them from the colonel for $5. So he said, anytime you want scarves, send Joe over to see Eddie and give him as many scarves as Joe wants, and Joe would sign a receipt for the scarves. And there, here is a picture of actually one of those original receipts signed by Joe Esposito for, I think, 250 scarves here. Another thing took place on the tour that was kind of funny, and, uh, and fortunately I took some pictures to remind myself of it, and I have the pictures here. Elvis had done a show somewhere in the East, and when he was taking his final bows, he, had his, uh, he was wearing the uh, black fireworks uh, jumpsuit, and he had his cape out. When he took the bow and he bent down, a guy in the, uh, that had come up to the stage from the audience jumped up and literally ripped the cape right off his back. I was behind a barricade, and when I saw that was happening, I jumped over, and as he landed with the cape, I ripped the cape out of his hands and kept it until the next day. I put it in one of our cases and took it on our plane with us, and the next day when we arrived at the next city for the show, I was unpacking the cases, and I saw the cape there, and uh, we decided we'd have some fun with the cape, and all the boys in the crew and a couple of the uh, promoters were there, and each of us took turns putting on the cape and spreading it out and turning, and I took some pictures. There's some pictures of Tom Hewlett, who was one of the promoters, and there's a picture of me wearing the cape, and we were all playing Elvis, and I didn't realize until... Uh, I developed the pictures or I took the film out of the camera that I only had black and white film in the camera at that particular instance because I really would have loved to have had that black cape with the red linen lining uh, in color, but that's okay. It's a good memory anyway. We were playing Memphis, Tennessee, and at the last minute, the colonel decided he wanted to have the show recorded by RCA and a live album put out. And we were all upstairs in the hotel room, and he got RCA, and uh, this was a few days before, of course. He told RCA to have all the things here to, to record this. And my uncle, Tom Diskin, said to the colonel, well, should we have Eddie take some special pictures of that? And the colonel, in a funny way, said, no, no, we don't need anything special. He said, when I need pictures, I just snap my fingers. Well, we didn't know at that time that the colonel had already made arrangements for someone in Memphis to take some pictures for that special album. It was a friend, a uh, friend's son, and he was in photography, and the colonel was going to do him a favor and let him do the, the album cover with his pictures. So we played Memphis, and that was the closing date. We went back home. We were in our studios at MGM, and about a week later, a large envelope showed up addressed to the colonel, and I brought it into him, and it was a bunch of pictures, 8 by 10 color pictures with uh, internegatives attached to them, or 4 by 5 negatives attached to them. And I went back to my desk. Five minutes went by, and the colonel, in his own inimitable way, yelled out in his loud voice, Eddie, come in here. And I went into the office, and he said, you need to get on a plane tonight and get to Memphis, take some pictures of the house, take some pictures of the grounds, take some pictures of the front gate. We need something for an album cover. I can't use any of this stuff. Well, unfortunately, the night before, my house had been broken into, and almost everything I owned had been stolen, including all my camera equipment. So I had to quickly call my camera store and ask them to stay open a little later that evening so I could get there in time to get new cameras to go to Memphis that night. I made a reservation on the midnight flight to Memphis and the Colonel had called Lamar Fike to meet me at the airport, pick me up around 5 6 o'clock in the morning, take me over to Graceland to take these pictures. And I took pictures of the gate, pictures of the house, and pictures of the grounds. Some of the pictures you may be looking at now are the actual test shots I took on Polaroid film 
to make sure that the exposure was correct of the house and of the gate. And there's another picture that shows the back of me. You can't tell it's me, of course, but I'm telling you it's me, honest. I think it's in a, in a purple shirt, long sleeve shirt, and I'm holding my camera taking pictures. Well, that's a picture of me that was taken by Lamar Fike, who was trying out my new 6x7 Pentax camera, and he really liked it. And he shot several pictures of me on the grounds while I was taking pictures. So I was done in a couple of hours. I went into Graceland, and uh, the cook was nice enough to make me a hamburger, which was my lunch and breakfast together. Lamar took me back to the airport. I got on a plane by, by 1 o'clock, and I was on my way back to Los Angeles. And uh, I had the pictures developed that same day. And the next day, I showed them to the colonel, and he picked out the ones he wanted for the album cover, front and back. And that's how that album cover came about. After one of the tours, we went directly into... Uh, Nevada to play at the uh, Sahara Tahoe Hotel in Lake Tahoe and uh, we only played usually 10 days at a time there 10 days or two weeks it wasn't uh, like the 30-day engagements we were doing in Las Vegas and as as same as Las Vegas at on the last day of the last night after the closing show uh, a lot of people would go upstairs to Elvis's suite for a closing night party and I was up at the party, and there was a set of couches, three couches set up in a U-shape. And Elvis was sitting directly across from me, and someone brought him his guitar, and he was strumming it. And someone would say, hey, do you remember this song? Play a little few bars of that. And he would start to sing it. And a couple times he would say, I can't remember the words to that. Uh, one of the songs was Old Shep. He said, I can't remember the second verse. And I told him what the words were. He says, yeah, that's it, and he, he continued to play it. And that happened two times and then three times. And after the third time, Elvis looked at me and he says, how do you know all the lyrics to my songs? And I said, well, I'm the one that types up your lyric sheets and keeps your book and puts them in there and takes them out. I said, and here's there's a picture, some examples of uh, the lyric sheets that uh, I've kept to this day from those books. In 1972 when the colonel came up with the idea of a worldwide satellite show for Elvis uh, from Hawaii. He had posters made up and in preparation for a press conference at which time that satellite show would be announced. The night before the press conference the printer sent up the posters to our office and the colonel went bananas when he saw me. He liked them so much they looked so good and he thought this was really nice for the press conference tomorrow. All of a sudden he said, hey, come here, take one of these posters downstairs to the dressing room. Elvis will be there in a few minutes. Have him look at this and tell him this is how we're promoting it for tomorrow and see what he says. But I want you to make sure he sees it personally. Don't give it to Joe to show him. You take it in and show it to him personally. I want to make sure he sees it. So I felt kind of stupid doing that. But anyway, I, <laughs> I took the poster downstairs and I... I told Joe I had this poster, and the colonel wanted me to show it to Elvis personally. He kind of laughed with me. Um, he knocked on the door, and we both went into Elvis's dressing room. Uh, there's, his dressing room was in two parts. One was where he actually did the dressing, and there was a makeup room next to that. And then there was a big living room and a bar and chairs and couches. Well, everybody else was in this room, and then Joe and I went in to where the dressing room was. And I said to Elvis... Elvis Colonel wants you to look at the poster that's going to be used for tomorrow's press conference so you know he's doing his job for you. And Elvis kind of smirked and laughed. He said, yeah, okay, I see it. And, and he said, uh, you want me to sign it? And I said, no, that's great, thank you. Looking back on that, I should have had him sign it and had kept it. It would probably be worth a fortune today. Anyway, I took it back upstairs to the Colonel and I showed it to him. And I said, Elvis saw it and he liked it and he was very happy about it. And so that took care of that. I'm still on the I'm on stage. I was up here. Yeah. Okay. South Vietnam. So, the young plus is never able to pick it up. The young plus is a chance. This is the first time that I've seen this myself. This is just the start of this. Would you try to? Please. I beg your pardon? Yeah. Okay. I really should start this 
conference off by congratulating Elvis because we will have two new firsts. The first first, new first, involves Elvis as the first performer to do a worldwide live concert via satellite. A real spectacular. And the second is that we will have a worldwide album via satellite. All of this has been made possible by the joint efforts of a lot of people, and especially including Colonel Tom Parker. Elvis, again, my congratulations for this spectacular. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's uh, very hard to comprehend it, because I... In 15 years, it's hard to comprehend that happening. You know. how, how to to all, the, all the countries all over the world via satellite, it's very difficult to comprehend. A live concert, to me, is exciting because of all the electricity that's, that's generated in the crowd and on stage. But uh, it, it's my favorite part of, of, of the business, is a live, live concert. How do you pace yourself? Sir? How do you pace yourself? Uh, you mean physically, vocally, or So you are up when you need to be up? I just, uh, I exercise every day. I vocalize every day. I practice if I'm working uh, or not. You know. So I just try to stay in shape all the time. Vocally and mentally. And Which is harder? <laughs> well, both is tough. Yeah, you got to work at them. But I, I don't mind it. You know, it's worth it. I must say this about the, uh, when we first approached the various countries around the world, uh, Elvis is a, certainly the only performer that could do this today. He is well known in every country that we have taught, in fact, in every country in the world. And the acceptance was just fantastic. It wasn't a case of any selling. Because, you know, he's been in demand for live performances around the world, but you just can't do this, so this is a way of approaching it, but these, the acceptance exceeded all of our expectations, Elvis. Thank you very much. That's very nice, sir. One of the other things I did on the tours, kind of for a change of pace, you might say, I helped with the security in front of the stage especially when there was a, a crowd that was especially wild or when the building had not gotten enough security personnel to really stand in front of the stage and keep the people from climbing up on the stage. But my career as a security guard at the front of the stage ended abruptly one evening in 1974 when I was holding back a girl who was exceptionally lovely, as all the girls were lovely at the Elvis show, but this one was unbelievably lovely. I was holding her back, and she was pressing against my arm, trying to get to the stage. And I was stronger, so I, I didn't let her get to the stage. And I felt something slapping the back of my head. And then I could hear one of the other guards saying, let her go, let her go. And then Elvis finally, let her go. He was hitting me in the back of the head with a scarf, because he wanted this girl to get through so he could give her a kiss and get, give her a scarf, too. And I thought, well, that's the last security I want to do anymore. So that ended my career as a security guard for the stage. From time to time, the colonel would be in a real rambunctious mood, you know, and he would say things like, don't let any live ones get away today. If someone calls, I want to talk to them. I don't care who it is. So we were in the office in Las Vegas, and the phone rang, and I picked it up. I asked to talk to the colonel. I said, sure, just a minute. The colonel picked the phone, hello, this is the colonel. And I couldn't hear what he was saying, of course, but the colonel said again, yeah, this is the colonel. I am the colonel. <laughs> so apparently the guy was telling the colonel that his daughter wanted to say hello to Elvis, and he was calling from New York to see if she could possibly say hello to Elvis. And the colonel says, yeah, I think we can arrange that. Elvis just left here. He says, Eddie, Eddie, quick, run down to get Elvis before he gets on the elevator. Bring him back here to say hello to this guy. So I sat at my desk and I clapped my desk with my hands to pretend I was running down the hall. And I waited a minute. And I came back and I said, Colonel, I missed him. Just as I got there, the elevator door closed. 
Colonel gets on the phone with the guy. He says, oh, we just missed him. Eddie ran down the hall, but the elevator door closed just as he got there. We missed Elvis. And the guy says, oh, Colonel, I want to thank you so much. That's the closest I ever came to talking to Elvis. A funny story that comes to mind about Elvis and the Colonel and Elvis gaining weight. In 75, when he played at the Hilton, and he had put on quite a bit of weight, actually. He he was worried about it. You know, Elvis was a little bit vain. He was the king of rock and roll, and he didn't want to look heavy. And opening night, we were all down in the dressing room, and he only did one show on opening night. And he had gotten dressed, and he came out into the living room area where we were just sitting down talking amongst all the all the boys, the bodyguards, and some visitors. And the colonel, Elvis said something about his weight. Does this look okay? You know, and the colonel said, don't worry about it. He says, I had an idea. He says, if you really want to take the sting off of this, he says, we could get you a rubber suit. And you put on a rubber suit, and then you put your jumpsuit over the rubber suit. And then we blow up the rubber suit so you get real big. He said, when you go out on stage... You walk out real slow and you're as big as a house. He said, and then we stick a hole in the rubber suit so that during the show, the air comes out of the suit and you get smaller and smaller and smaller. After the show, people will say, you know, when he first came out, he looked a little heavy, but he looked fine when he left. I remember that in 1976, there was a, a big to-do about the Colonel and Elvis breaking up or almost breaking up. And it happened the closing night after uh, Las Vegas engagement. And uh, there was a big argument in the dressing room after the show. The colonel and staff went upstairs to our offices. And the colonel stayed up all night having papers written up how he and Elvis would dissolve their contract. And he sent the papers upstairs with George Parkhill to be delivered uh, I guess to Joe Esposito for Elvis. The next day we all went home. Uh, for us, that was back to MGM Studios in Culver City. For the next couple of weeks, there was just no word from Elvis. And, you know, Colonel thought he would sign the papers and get them back to him or do whatever he was going to do. And the Colonel was each day trying to find out something, if there was any word about what was going on, and he would call Red West or Sunny West or Joe Esposito, and they said, no, there's no word, Elvis is still upstairs. He said nothing about it. So after a couple of weeks, I was sitting in my office at MGM, and there's some pictures of the office there with my office and the kitchen and Tom Diskin's office, and the private line ring. We had four lines and one of them was a private line that only Elvis or Vernon Presley called in on. And I answered the phone simply by saying, hello. And the voice on the other end said, Eddie, it's Elvis. Is the colonel in? And I said, yes, he is. Just a minute, I'll get him. And I got up from my desk and I ran in and I whispered to the colonel, Colonel, it's Elvis. And the colonel, who always liked to have a little advantage over someone when he was talking to them or dealing with anyone, said, well, tip me off. How does he sound? And I said, he sounds very mellow. And he says, okay. So he picked up the phone, and I ran back to my office and put the phone on the hook, and then I went back to the door, and I listened. <laughs> and the conversation was very short, probably not more than a minute. The colonel said, yeah, 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 okay. All right, that's what we'll do. I'll set up some more tours. And he hung up the phone. And I says, what did he say? And that's what the colonel said. Uh, he just wants things to be the way they were. Get back to normal. That was as long as the conversation took. The breakup, or the almost breakup, was over. We started setting up tours again, and everything went on as as, as normal as it could have been after that. Funny story I remember about Elvis laughing very hard it happened in Denver, Colorado, back in the early, I say the early days, back in the earlier 70s. I, I can't remember the exact date, but it, it was after a show, and it was a great show, and we were all downstairs celebrating, and my uncle Tom Diskin had a couple of drinks too many that night. So when, when the celebrating was over, I was helping him up to the room, 
and he was feeling no pain, but he was in a great, great mood and laughing and telling jokes. We went up the elevator. When we got to the top floor, which was our floor where Elvis was, the elevator door opened, and Elvis was standing across from the elevator, leaning against the wall, smoking a cigar. <laughs> and Tom, Tom looked at me and says, Hello, Elvis. <laughs> and Elvis looked at him, and his eyes got real big, and he just started laughing. And as I walked away with Tom, Elvis is telling the guy next to me, he says, I've never seen Mr. D Mr. Diskin drunk. He says, never seen him anything but, you know, just as sober as a judge. And he thought that was the funniest thing he, he could imagine, seeing Tom that way. And uh, I told Tom about it the next day because he did not remember, and he got a kick out of it too. Over the years, a lot of people have asked me why I don't have my name on so many album covers that I did and single sleeves and things like that. And basically the reason is simply that the Colonel didn't believe in giving photo credit for those kinds of things. Uh, in 1975, I was very ill and I stayed home from a tour. And while I was home, I put together a new photo album because we had been selling the old one for quite a while. And the first day the Colonel back came back one of my duties was to pick him up at his apartment and take him to the studio. And when I got there, he was very excited about seeing the mock-up of the new photo album I was making. So as soon as he opened the door, he says, have you got it? And I said, oh yeah, here it is, Colonel. And he sat down in his chair and I sat down on the couch next to him. And he started looking through this binder of the mock-up photos. And he was very complimentary about how great it was and what great pictures and this and that. And I started talking to him and saying, Colonel, you know, I've never had any photo credit on any of my pictures or posters or any of the album covers. I said, would it be possible to get my name in there somewhere? And he said, no, we don't give photo credit. We don't put anybody's name for photos. And I surprised myself by being as bold as I was at that moment. And I reached over and I took the photo album out of his hand. And I said, then we can't work together anymore. Well, I thought he was going to go crazy. <laughs> He just shook his head and said, well, you can't hit me with this kind of thing so early in the morning. You've got to give me time to warm up and to think about this. Let's go to the studio and we'll work something out. So I drove him to the studio. And, oh, we were there about an hour. And once again from his office, he yelled, Eddie, which was my key to come into him. He was sitting behind his desk. He didn't have anything in his hands. He just turned to me and says, how does this sound to you, Eddie? He put his hands up like this and he said, Select Photos by E. Bonja. And I'm thinking, on the cover, boy, that's incredible. That'll be great, Colonel. Thank you very much. And he says, We'll take care of you. So I left. Several weeks later, after I had sent all the artwork to the printer, I got back a mock up of the photo album, like this. And I was disappointed right away because there was nothing on the front cover that had my name on it. And I thought, well, maybe put it on the inside cover. And I looked through the photo album very carefully. No photo credit at all. After about three times going through the album, I figured he made a mistake. He left my name out. So I got on the phone and I called back to Florida. And I talked to Steve Rinaldi, who was the printer. And I said, I got the mock-ups of the photo album, but you forgot to put my photo credit on there. He said, no, Ed, I didn't forget to put your photo credit on there. He said, it's in there. I said, I've looked three times. I can't find it. He says, open the, the photo book to the inside back cover and look down in the right-hand corner. And I opened it up and I looked down in the right-hand corner. And by God, if you use a magnifying glass, you can see where it says exactly what the colonel told me it would say. Select photos by E. Bonja. So that was the colonel's way of getting even for kind of surprising him with a question and an answer in the morning when he wasn't prepared for it. Uh, about a year later, they redid the photo album, put a new cover on it for another volume, and they took my photo credit out. So <laughs> now you know why I never got any photo credit for anything, except this one time, and it's barely visible. One of my favorite memories of Elvis, and one of my, and my favorite, not one of my, but my favorite picture of Elvis was taken on the very first tour uh, 
in September 1970. The closing date of that tour was Mobile, Alabama. And following the show, we sent all the show people home on the show plane, and the colonel had flown home earlier on his Learjet. And Elvis was using a, a I think it was a British-made plane, a BAC Bach 111, which was really neat. I'd never been on a customized plane like that. And Tom Diskin, my uncle, and I were going to go back to Los Angeles on Elvis's plane, which was very exciting for me. In the back of the plane... It was set up so that there was a couch on either side of the aisle, and then there was a bathroom in the very back of the plane. And I was sitting in the back next to my uncle. Elvis finally arrived and gave a lot of autographs downstairs and kissed a lot of girls that were friends of the security people that let him in to meet Elvis. And then he finally came up the stairs, and he came back to where the restroom was, or the bathroom. He said, I need to wash my face. It's hot out there. He went in and he washed his face. When the door opened and he came out, he closed the door, I picked up my camera to take a picture of him. And as gracious and nice as Elvis is, he was, wasn't facing me, so he turned a little bit to face me straight on so I get a nice front picture of him. And as naive as I was, being the first tour I was ever on and a new at photography both, I said to him, oh, that's okay, you don't have to pose. And he said to me, I'm not posing, what do you want me to do? And then he said something I really can't repeat on camera, but I should have taken a picture then. But anyway, I took this picture of him, which you can see in this white coat. And you can see he's got a cigar in his hand because he smoked those little cigars like cigarillos. And to this day, that is my favorite picture and probably my favorite memory of Elvis.